Um, I want to introduce to you Renata Goldberg. She's a PhD candidate in the Department of Family Social Science, so she's coming all the way from the St. Paul campus. <laughs> <laughs> Good that we had good weather. She's a licensed graduate social worker in the state of Minnesota. And her interests are in the effects of work-based policies on low-income families, socioeconomic barriers toward entry into the middle class, the role of corporate responsibility in building family capacity and resilience. Uh, she's published three articles since 2013. And she is uh, co-authoring with myself and Sarah Flood a paper that's going to be presented at the Population Association meeting. Oh, so right there. Her talk today is to gig or not to gig, exploring the effects of social determinants and employment motivation behind informal work choices. And I want to reiterate that this is, as there are many in this series, a work in progress. So we're, she wants us to yes. be gentle. <laughs> <laughs> and we want to give you a life course in a oh, look. Thank so, you. Okay, thank you very much, Renata. Thank you. Well, I want to say thank you um, for coming to this talk. Thank you to the Life Course Center for the invitation. Um, this is a work in progress, and I just want to, um, but it's coming from a, an informed place, and I look forward to your thoughts on this topic, um, your suggestions on how I can make this paper better. Um, briefly, I'm going to briefly go through a background. What is gig work? Some theoretical foundations to understand informal and gig work choice. Um, what I have dubbed a spectrum of work, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, I'll talk about um, my study's design, data, and then the results, and then some discussion. And because since I study uh, family policy, um, I have some, imp some implications for future research and for policy. Um, so where is this coming from? Okay, I am a family social scientist. And um, my dissertation work, oh, I walk around a lot too. I'll try to kind of keep that, to bring that in. My, my dissertation work, um, what? I can walk, okay. My dissertation work um, is actually on um, the paid sick leave ordinance in Minneapolis. So back in 2016, Minneapolis uh, passed the paid sick leave, the earned sick and safe leave um, citywide ordinance, which meant that um, all workers in the city were eligible to earn uh, pay sick leave. And um, so my study, I'm looking at whether this policy, um, the way that it was designed, if it will actually be effective for employee caregivers, and particularly for African American caregivers. Um, I am a critical uh, researcher, critical race researcher, so I'm interested in how um, African Americans in particular some data, we are about 19% of the population in Minneapolis, and yet 46, 47% of us um, are working and we are living below the poverty threshold. And so I wanted to see if this policy is going to have some, Im some implications on these employed caregivers, how they take care of their families, their family stress levels, their mental and physical health, how they take care of their families or not. And so um, I did a qualitative study back in 2017. And um, I had some focus groups, and my findings were that folks were talking about income and not necessarily work. And so that's a key point, that the, they felt that work was sexist, racist, that there were barriers um, uh, that they had to overcome to be marginally successful. And so the topic was more about how they got money into the house more so than type of jobs they worked. So I thought that was interesting. Um, they also talked about working gig and informal work. Now granted, they didn't say they worked gig work. They didn't say they said, oh, Renata, I'm an informal worker. Um, but the type of work that they described fell into these kind of pots. And so if they were, if they were um, temporarily laid off, um, we're hoping to get hired back on, like if they worked a contract job. But in the meantime, um, they were, um, um, one person says she baked cakes. So, and then she sold cakes from, from her home. That's an informal work activity. Um, some people said that they did hair in their homes or they cut hair. Um, folks were saying that they worked for Lyft or for Uber, and we kind of 
know those keywords as being part of what we kind of think of as a gig, as a gig economy. And so these words and these topics kind of came up in this qualitative work on paid sick leave. Um, and what they were most concerned about was that there were that less income barriers was more important for them so much so than the paid sick leave policy. Because again, work, income is what brought money into the home, not necessarily an attachment to work. Um, okay. And so, what is gig work? Oh, I gave you all the answers already. Okay. <laughs> So I know for, for myself, um, I've been hearing this, these terms, gig work, gig work, gig work, and not really knowing what that, what does that really mean. And in the literature, we still don't really know what that means. We, we have such a wide, I want to walk now, we have such a wide concept of what gig work is. Um, it's termed as short-term work engagements. Um, some folks think that it's the explicit use of an app-based platform, like if you're selling something off of Etsy, or if you are doing, or if you're a Lyft driver or an, or an Uber driver. Um, Abraham et al. said that, well, it's the same as a music gig. It's uh, one-off assignments for a particular task and defined time. And yet they go on to say that it's also anyone who files a 1099. <laughs> Um, I have qualms with that, and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, and then the most broad definition we have is offered by uh, Katzen Kruger, and this is independent contractors, consultants, freelancers, temp agency workers, um, on-call workers, um, and contract company workers. This is the most broadest term, and when we use this term, um, we get, um, we catch people who identify as having a self-employment identity. Um, maybe not so much people who are doing gig work to earn extra money or they're in between skill sets or, or in between positions. So we have this broad range here. And this kind of gets to where I'm looking at the research as and gig work in particular in this kind of spectrum of work that we don't just, we're moving away from, hmm, I'm, I'm, I'm going to back up a second. Um, there's a wonderful book out there, and I shouldn't bring it up without having the author's name, but it's called Temp, T-E-M-P. It's a bright yellow jacket. Oh, this book is so good. Um, talks about how our idea of our self-concept, our relationship to work, to formal work identity, is primarily based on the 30 years after World War II and in like the 1970s. Um, and where work was precarious, it was a lot of gig work, there was a lot of things going on before, and now we're entering the same sphere where work isn't as stable, work is more precarious. Um, I tell my husband, I say, I am a precarious employee. My work is not stable right now. My inc and the income coming into the home is not coming from the same sources um, in any given semester. Um, and so when I look at the spectrum of work, um, it's, there's informal work, there's formal work, and then there's this gig work. Um, and so I'm looking at work through work control, so the control that an employee or an employer has to work, and the autonomy that that employee or worker has. And so, I want to move back over again. So when I look at whether an employee or employer relationship, <coughs> relationship exists in formal work, Yes, we know that. There's a, there's a boss, there's an employee. Um, and informal work, no. I should have added a question mark there because typically those type of activities are being self-generated, self-explored. In gig work, maybe. That's the blurry line where, where there are these um, relationships that a person may have to the broker of the gig work, but, it, um, but that relationship is, is um, it's nuanced. I'm looking at how tasks or work are brokered. And so with formal work, an employee knows that their work tasks are coming from an from employer, from their supervisor. And informal work, again, is being brokered through that individual themselves. And in gig work, it can be both. When I think about a Lyft driver, their broker is the digital app platform. It's Lyft saying, hey, 
You said you would work for us at this time. Here's a job. Go and do that. Looking at level of work autonomy, informal work, it's employer established, where they say this is the leeway I give you to do this work, or these are the restrictions I have for you to do this work. Um, and, and informal work is established by an individual. And gig work is contracted and complicated. And so when I'm thinking about people who, okay, let's, let's move away from, um, from Lyft drivers. Um, how about those who are working in like Upwork or, or what I call skilled freelancers? So these are people who are maybe graphic artists or they're doing reports or they're, or they're doing some kind of um, intellectual work. Uh, that work is contracted for a certain price. Their profits that they share with the broker that, um, that makes it so that they can get that work. But it's also a bit complicated because who is the owner of that work? Um, how much they earn from it varies uh, based off of skill set, based off of experience, based off of your rating on the app. And so all those things are, are, much, more, are, are much more muckier. And then finally, I'm looking at how wage or pay is determined and profits are negotiated. And that's a little bit similar to um, what I just talked about before, where it's employer negotiated, when it's formal work, informal work is set by the individual, and then again, it comes down to when it's gig work, that is the individual agrees to whatever is the contract and amount, and that can vary widely depending on type of gig work, type of um, <coughs> the worker themselves. And then, and even the platform that they choose to uh, broker their their services on. And I'm pretty informal. Do you have any questions? Would yeah. you see self-employment on this? Like if I were self-employed? Or oh, I am so glad you asked, Anne. Yep. Mm -hmm. So glad you asked that. Mm -hmm. um, self-employed. Yeah. Yeah. I would put them under informal work, okay. just because. Um, well, we're going to get to that next, actually. Okay. So that's a good segue into this. So I, again, am a family social scientist, and we are big on theory. We love our theory. <laughs> My department says you can't do a darn thing unless you have a theory attached to it. And so that's how I'm being trained. Um, when I uh, presented this last week to APAM, which um, is the, it's the Association for Public Policy and Management, they are not so theory driven. Maybe folks here maybe, maybe are more empirically driven. Um, but I'm looking at what, what theory can help me look at the spectrum of work. And so I'm looking at um, ident identity theory. Uh, primarily social and work identity, and it's the internalization of a role as part of one's self-concept. I'm really interested to see if whether one's work identity, like a self-employed identity, if that has any bearing on um, their decision to uh, move into gig work, or to move out of gig work, to move in and out of formal work. Um, social ident identities can be can be can be involuntary, I'm missing, they can be involuntary or voluntary. And so by involuntary, I'm talking about sex, I'm talking about race, um, voluntary um, parenthood, uh, uh, marriage or being partnered. Um, a work identity is the collection of meaning that's attached to the self. It's influenced by this work-life environment that is derived from their relationship with work peers and supervisors. And so this tells us that our role, our work identity role, the one that we assume as a part of our self-concept, um, that there's a relationship, there's an interaction between the environment in which we work and live and how that influences our, our view of ourself. Um, I'm also looking at symbolic interactionism. Um, this theory explains human behavior through meaning making, symbols, names, and behavior that's indicative to the role. So it's, um, when I first thought of this, I thought, oh, like branding. So if, I'm a, if I choose to be a part of um, Upwork or a part of a TaskRabbit or um, some kind of a online platform where I will put my services on, um, I'm agreeing to this brand of work that they have established and that they are promoting as good work and um, work that uh, should be paid a certain amount, um, that there's meaning in joining in that type of a work. 
and I'll get back to that in a second too. And so when I think about gig work and work identity, gig work maintains a work identity and the provision and reoccurrence of work behavior. So one is laid off or one is unemployed. Um, if you have a work identity that's attached to formal labor, gig work is a, is, is, in, um, is a type of work where it's replicating this behavior, that you're working, you're still out there, you're, you're still doing those, those actions and those behaviors. It's the association of a work broker that resembles a formal work employee, employer behavior, and expectations. So um, you may be taking on more risk by being in the gig economy, um, but it mimics, again, this relationship that if you have a formal work identity, um, that's something that feels more secure than going rogue and going into the informal work where you're working for, for yourself. And finally, gig work does not challenge one's formal work identity. So a lot of the data, or should I say a lot, but um, data, I'm gonna pick on the BLS data, the Contingency Worker Supplement on the CPS data. Um, an issue with that data source is that they're asking people, um, what's your primary work? And if they say, my primary work is contingency work, then they're missing out on a whole group of people who may have a work identity that is a full-time employee or a formal employee, and yet they're participating in work that is uh, uh, gate work or informal work. Yeah. I just like to see if I understand. So if they ask a musician who really sees themselves as a musician, but they have a day job as a barista, then they might say musician because that's the way they identify. They might. Yeah. Right. Um, let me give, it, um, give another example. Um, how about someone who has been, someone who is looking for, so they've been laid off, they're looking for a new job, they, had, they were a teacher and it's really hard, okay, I'm gonna pick, pick on my, my sister-in-law, okay. Um, she, um, she was in the nonprofit world and after 2008, boom, right? The nonprofit world was really hit and she was in, she worked in development and it was really hard for her to get a new job in development. Okay. That was her identity. I mean, she, she had a master's degree in, in that work and yet she was um, taking on um, informal work activities. Like, um, uh, she wasn't necessarily doing gig work at that time. That wasn't quite as big as we think of it now. Um, but she was like taking side jobs, like, um, um, she would go uh, grocery shopping for the folks in her neighborhood, and they would pay her to do that. Um, but if you asked her, Sarah, what's your, what's your work identity? She would say, I am a development officer, and you wouldn't even know about that other side work that she's doing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there any other questions before I move on? So this brings me to this, this spectrum of work. So this is like theoretical, it's kind of big, it's kind of like what's happening out there. And I think that informal work is on one side, formal work is on the other, and gig work fluctuates between both of these worlds. Um, it's influenced by one's meaning of work, of income and risk, motivation to seek non-formal work if they want to be in that role, um, their developed sense of work identity. If I am truly, if I see myself as a formal work, if, if I see myself as um, someone who is a worker for, in the formal work labor workforce, I'm probably, I'm less, I'm less, I'm more reluctant to kind of move in this because there's, there's just more risk involved. Mm -hmm. That's not a part of my, of my experience. It's not part of who I see myself as. Tax and legal classification. Okay, so that's a whole other thing too. So we get back to the, um, um, uh, there was a paper where um, they were looking at, they couldn't understand why there was a discrepancy between people who were contingency workers in the CPS data and the census data and 
that number didn't match what we were seeing in the tax records. And it's because people may have one work identity, they're telling the census folks one thing, and yet they're filing taxes because they have to as another. And so it's this discrepancy that we're not catching when we say what's your primary work, and if you say that you are a development officer, then we don't ask you anymore about what your other work, act, your other work activities are. This access to work and her income generation, again, and, and that kind of leads us down to, this, to the barriers to formal work. Informal work, um, what my participants in my paid sick leave uh, project said is that um, a good thing about informal work is that um, they had the, is that the onus of income was on them. No one could tell them that they weren't qualified. No one could tell them that because of their um, incarceration or because of their education level that they weren't able to do a certain job. Um, that can happen in formal work. And then again, and, and then it's the skill set and marketability. If you have a skill set that you can use to then come up with different ways to bring income into the home, that's a part of this. And then also your social location. So I'm interested, again, I'm a critical researcher. I'm interested in how race, sex, and class, how these things work together and how they influence um, the type of person that, go, that chooses to go into gig work. Um, not so much informal work, but, but gig work. And then um, how they're treated once they're in those gig jobs. Could I just clarify for a moment? So the woman who's baking cakes at home and mm -hmm. selling them, is that informal work, not gig work? That would be informal work. And that's a great segue, because that leads to my definition of okay. gig work. Y'all are good, thank you. I love it. <laughs> okay, so remember when I said that I don't like this definition. I didn't like those other ones. This is what I've put together. This is what I'm thinking, okay? It's working paper, right? It's a work in progress. So I'm thinking that, huh, gig work is work that's performed by an individual for a specific short-term task is brokered by third-party affiliation or platform. Um, some researchers like to say, well, um, it has to be app-based and it's technology-based. And I'm, I'm, I'm more open to it being brokered um, by a third party, more so than it is about the platform that, it, that they get the work on. And I think that leaves us open to, um, well, what happens if, if Lyft goes away? What happens if these, these platforms that we um, have attached a brand to, what happens if they go away? And granted, I've been watching The Handmaid's Tale, and it's like, it's so bad. It's all the way. <laughs> so, so I left this open right there. Um, it's also, okay, now here's, okay. So in which the relationships between the worker and that third party, and the worker and the employer, the person who's contracting for the work, for the work carries no further expectation for conducting work beyond the contracted short-term task. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's these two relationships. Yeah. So Vanessa. if I understand that, temp agencies are your third-party affiliation. They could be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be a third party, right? I'm saying that in gig work that there is a third party there because if there's not that third party there, then it it, it can fall more into informal work where, where I'm finding the work, work myself um, and that falls more under, um, there's more autonomy when I find my own work, um, there's more control, there's more, so, so I think that there is a third party relationship that's, that is the broker, so that there's these two relationships. So um, I'm thinking of the example of like if someone is a freelance language translator. There's no work to be doing, like baking the cake, even though maybe I'm making my Etsy products or whatever to sell later, or to, there's only going to be the work that I'm going to do if the job comes in, or mm -hmm. if I find the job. Oh, that's the point that you're saying. We're, mm -hmm. we're seeking out our own work, which means that it's not gig work. It doesn't have to be gig work. Well, there's no right. third party Something necessarily if you're working directly with the person who wants the translation. Right. The okay. Right. I would say um, maybe gig work could be the person. Okay, so um, I was getting some translation done a few years ago. Okay. I needed some, some things done in Russian. And um, I went to an agency. I see. 
the agency had a list of people that they just called on. Okay. These people can can do Russian, and we had the three of them. And so, this could be their gig work. Yes. Um, if they had, if the direct, if the Russian translator had had an ad in like a newspaper, oh, who does anyone? Um, <laughs> they had an ad in, on like um, Craigslist. They said I I can do translations for fifty bucks an hour. Then 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 that would be then I would consider I would classify that more as an informal work. Yeah. Yes. So is to what you're saying it is an additive to that then that the work is being done under the brand of the third party. So you could take an Uber or that language agency or so on versus a self-employed. The works under my brand is me as an individual with that direct relationship. Yes, I'm so glad you brought that up. Y'all are awesome. <laughs> um, I don't see a name tag. Oh, wait. Carl. 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 Okay. Um. <laughs> 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 oh, <laughs> They're just messing with you. And they're messing with, come on. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's about this branding idea. Yeah, I um, and I'm going to talk about that in a second too. But but it's um, it's um, and that falls. That's why it's gig. That's why it falls more on the gig word because there are more restrictions and there's more barriers. So um, I am picking on Lyft. I was just in. Um, I just came back from D.C. a few days ago, and so I was taking Lyft places and. Um, like the Lyft app, they um, like like I can rate the cars' mm -hmm. cleanliness. They have to um, um, if I'm using like Lux, if I think that the car is Lux or not, and so it's it's what, having huh? Lux 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 L U X. Sorry, well, I thought you said Lux. Oh. <laughs> I don't see how that fits into. Oh well, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But there's also those that Lyft driver is also being rated, and if their rating slips, then their pay amount slips, and whether they get jobs slips. That wouldn't happen if they were. An informal driver, or um, not necessarily so much even informal labor. I mean, there's like performance reviews, and um, but that minute and that fast um, by so many people that can rate you, and then your your rating drops. Same thing um, if you were selling on eBay or selling on Etsy. If your rating drops, um, people are less inclined to want to work with you. Yeah, there's a question over here. Um, what do you consider short-term task? Short-term task. Yeah, I, I, um, that is a little vague or a little goosey. Um, yes, I would fall into the all other researchers who also say short-term. Um, um, I guess I just have an example. Yeah, I, I hire um, individuals to do care for my son who has special needs. And I might hire a husband-wife team for a weekend. Mm -hmm. um, some I have an agency that I contract with to do all the payroll and all the background check and all that kind of stuff. So would they be considered gig workers or would they be considered independent contractors? But are they they are they hired through the agency or is the agency uh, only no. the agency is doing the payroll side of things? You are contracting with the individual. I hire and train and schedule and. Sign off on. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's that? see. It's all for personal contacts. Oh, okay. <laughs> if, if they don't identify as a self employee, right. as, as that they're getting work brokered through other companies to do their work because they are self employed, okay, they, so are, they are care, care takers or yeah. care, mm -hmm. caregivers. So then I would say that they wouldn't fall under people okay. because, again, it comes uh, back to that. So concept of what's my work identity too? Yeah, and I think who pays them? Do you pay them directly, or do you pay that agency? No, um, he's on a waiver, a government waiver. So the pay actually comes through the county oh, and state system. Mm -hmm. It's more complicated. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I know a little bit about that through, through my social, social background. Yeah. Right. So there. So the agency. Um, has contracted with the state of Minnesota or with the county or, or both. It depends on where the funds are coming from. 
Um, so they're waiting on the money to come in from those sources, and they're paying the folks from that money, but it is a little bit, I mean, yeah. So, so they're not getting money directly from you. They're not getting the money directly from the state or the county. They're, they're, getting it, they're getting it from the agency that they've so, so sent out their work party. to. Me. It is their party, yeah. Well, no, the money, the waiver, the waiver comes from the county. Right, but they're not getting that, they're not getting the money from the from Ramsey County or from from the county. They're they're getting a check or a direct deposit from the agency that they've contracted their work through. Of my workers? Yeah, likely. If they're working with, with the um if they're working with an agency that because because those those contracts are like hard there, it's a lot of work to even get those contracts and to get but they are, from they those don't contracts. have a contract. They're all, I'm the only person they work for. Are they you work. paying them directly? Oh, no. So there's no agency for them. So no. there's no agency. No. You are right. You you write them a check. No. Well, I I pay someone to coordinate all that and to take out the taxes and da 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 da. And that's the third party. The but the third party is not brokering the services. Correct. The third party is only engaging in administration. And administration of the payroll, the background check, and all that. And then this comes down to my catch-all. Do they identify as so so? If they do, then they would say, well, like that's a part of my work. And they may so in your instance they may only work for you, but they but let's just say that they have other families that they work for and they have a schedule like um, yeah, um like another type of kid. Well, I'm saying yeah. oh, oh, in another right, situation, right? Sure. That if they if they if they did, then they can say, well, this is my business. This is Correct. this is what I do. Mm -hmm. This is part of my identity. And if they didn't, if they if they were still trying to find a development officer job. And they most then they might refer to that work as big. Okay. Yeah, you're still with me. Yeah. This is fun. It's like <laughs> it's like yeah, like let's test this out again. This just came out of my head like a month ago, and so I'm like, well, is this is this something that that I can work with? And with short term tasks, I think that can be open to the type of big work it is. If you are working for Uber, that short-term task can be like 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Or if you are working for a family, that short-term task can be two days. Right. Or if you're working, um, um, if, if you're doing um, graphic design artwork, that can be <coughs> two weeks. But the, but it's not long-term. It's not, it's not an expectation that this will keep going. Um, I might yeah. look at if I can add some other language that's that deals with expect expectation and duration of time mm -hmm. that will That's help good. help mm -hmm. help to clarify that a bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Carla, no, Carl. From the financial side, I think you could also distinguish gig to self-employed in terms of what parties can take credit for revenue. Mm -hmm. So in other words, in an Uber deal, even though the driver is getting some revenue, Uber can take credit for revenue received also. Yeah. If you're hiring a care worker through an agency, an agency can take credit for revenue, but Carla, in your situation, since you've got the direct arrangement for the care provider, the agency can't take credit for the revenue that is generated by the caregiver. Only Correct. The only revenue they get is a monthly fee to manage our account. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you pay and that you fee. Pay that. Yeah. 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 Right. So that might be another. I just say that, like in companies, I mean, this is it's an emergent area. We yeah. don't, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. these definitions. But like in the company that we studied, the Fortune 500 company, they had a lot of contract workers, mm -hmm. and which were were so it was not an open ended. That's why it was short term relationship, like what you're saying. Mm -hmm. It might have been three years, but it was still not. You're going to keep working. But, and also, it was the company, let's call it Tomo, which we did call it that. Tomo um, does assigns the task and does all those things like you do. But the person who handles the payroll right. and all is this third party. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and I, that's why I think yours is that third party matters, because you couldn't manage this on your own. No. 
So I could try, but it's way more efficient to have someone do that. Right, and it's more efficient for Tomo because yeah. then Tomo doesn't have to pay them benefits. Right, right. They're mm. great work. Right. Mm -hmm. so, I was just going to ask the question. There used to be like this big rule in the company I worked for. You could not have a contractor for more than a year yeah. because you worried they were going to turn around and sue you for unemployment benefits mm -hmm. or whatever, even though you contracted. They through, changed that rule. Through part, through it through. only applies to pension plan prop sure now. Okay, when did they change that? I'm just a few years it. back. Okay. So the, the year rule is now just used exclusively for whether they're eligible for profit sharing or pension plan. Okay. So they could be an independent contractor and be eligible if you they if you employ them and more I, than twelve consecutive yeah. months. And I think some company, I mean, Medtronic would say if we so that might be. I'm sure that's true. I didn't realize that, but wouldn't have anyone on for more than a year because yeah, of the. Couldn't do performance reviews. Yeah. Anything about the employer or the contractor's performance would have to be dealt by the third party because of this implied employment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay. you just automatically either had a higher or get rid of them after a year. So I just yeah. wondered right. how that figured in with what you were talking about. <laughs> yeah. Well, right. they might have to go back to India for a month and then right. start. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I just went back here because. Um, Carl brought up all profits, and I think that's a part of, of this discussion too, is, is how profits, not just pay, but how profits from that work that's being done. I saw this more so um, in research that looked at um, people in um, skilled work, so, those, so those, those skilled freelancers, and when work was um, Intellectual property. Sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting over a flu too. So the words are here. It's just a matter of getting them out of here. Um, but that's also nuance too. And it, it it's like it's contracting and agreeing, negotiating with terms that may look very different for um, someone who's a skilled freelancer and working in Upwork than maybe someone working um, in in a different type of 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 gig work. That's that's a wide, wide spectrum. Let's talk a question over here. Well, um, there's a company called Cooperative Development Services, and I believe that they operate as a collective consultancy where they make cross referrals. So, like, um, if one person has a specialty in startups and another in uh, expansions or something like that, and some, you know, an inquiry comes in, then they'll point the, the, to the other person but they don't kind of have a central control or entity that, um, you know, dictates who does what, but they're long-term collectively associated. Do they collect kickbacks for referrals? I don't Because it might just be like a referral network and no money exchange. Yeah, I don't know. I kind of had the feeling that maybe they did get some because otherwise there'd be a tendency, I think, to natural human tendency to try to mold your skills to the job and take it yourself rather than hand it off. They do direct service themselves. And it's it's a fee for the, the co-op they're working with. Mm -hmm. Or a fee based on the, the percentage of the financing they arrange. I brought this back because we're not Gig work is is a little yellow, it's a little maroon, mm -hmm. um, and it's not the same for every type of gig worker or every type of gig type of job. That's great definition. Yeah. That's it's like a catch. It's, it's like right, right. Where where we're not trying to say, okay, well, it is. It falls within these parameters. Mm -hmm. It's on the spectrum, and it kind of 